Well, many would know the name of Muhammad Ali, right? I mean, great boxer of the 60s. Now, world-famous boxer, known for boxing. Maybe you know him through a couple of statements of, uh, of things like, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, right? Or how about, I am the greatest. He wasn't really known for his humbleness. Uh, you wouldn't say if you knew anything about Muhammad Ali, well, that guy, he's humble. Um, in fact, story goes that he was flying from back east over to the west coast, and uh, somewhere in the air they hit quite a bit of turbulence, enough that the pilot gets on the overhead speakers and says, you know, to buckle up, we're hitting some turbulence. And so the flight attendants is head down, and, and they are making sure that all of the passengers have buckled up. And one of the flight attendants comes across Muhammad Ali and says, sir, uh, we're hitting some turbulence, so please buckle up your seatbelt. Of which he responded and said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. Of which, her, to her quick wit reply, she said, Superman don't need no plane. Buckle up your seatbelt. <laughs> oh, is that brilliant? Pride. Man, pride can get in the way. Of our lives, can it not? Our pride, our arrogance can get in such a way that we start building up and we start thinking that we can do whatever we want, however we want to do it. I am autonomous. I can make my own decisions. Thank you very much. Please don't speak into anything. I am refusing any kind of correction, any kind of direction, because I am myself and I can choose my own way, right? I mean, that is just riff in our society, isn't it? Uh, there's a lot of that. So, of course, the Bible has a name for that. Uh, they call that foolishness. Uh, but we'll be seeing a whole lot of that in our study through the first few chapters of Proverbs, because Proverbs... As we go through the first nine chapters of the book of Proverbs, what we're studying this summer, as we go through here, what we see is that this is dealing with character traits, and the aim of God's word here in Proverbs is for us to have wisdom, for us to be wise, and what we're going to come across is those who have wisdom, those who as well as those who will mock wisdom, and, and as well as those who are rather simple, simple-minded, or naive, uh, is another way to put that. Perhaps you heard the joke about Sherlock Holmes, the great detective, and his sidekick, Dr., uh, or Dr. Watson. They went camping one night, and as they uh, we're out camping on their trip. They had a hearty meal and a few drinks and then laid down for the night, went to sleep. And some hours throughout the night, uh, Sherlock Holmes woke up and nudged his faithful friend and said, Watson, Watson, I want you to look up in the sky and tell me, what do you see? Of course, Dr. Watson looks up and he says, I see millions and millions of stars all around. So Sherlock Holmes responds, and he says, uh, so what does that tell you? After a minute or so of pondering, Watson said, well, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Horologically, I deduce that the time is approximately a quarter past three in the morning. Theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful and that we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, I suspect that it will be a beautiful day today. What does that tell you? Holmes was silent for a moment, then he responds, Watson, you idiot, someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> Man, some of us are just plain unaware of our surroundings, aren't we? <laughs> can completely miss what God has for us. We can be doing a whole lot of things and completely miss the surroundings and miss what God has for us. The simple-minded, the naive. There's the mockers, the arrogant, the prideful. There's those who are naive. But we want wisdom, don't we? When we going through life, I want wisdom. I want to make choices that are going to bring blessings and honor to others. And 
I want to, I want to be able to parent well. You are parents. You want to parent well. You, you, you want to be able to be a good worker, a good employee or employer. You want to be faithful to your spouse. You, you want to be satisfied in, in God, to, to be satisfied in him. What we have before us, the book of Proverbs, a message to the church to, with, with principles. It's packed with principles to experience the good life, how to enjoy the benefits that come from attaining wisdom and avoiding a, a heap of heartache. How do we avoid all the struggles and heartaches? It is a call that Proverbs will give for anyone who wants it. Anybody who's listening, anybody who will grab a hold of it, it's available for us. Wisdom. So we began this study last week. We looked at the first seven verses. We're going to look at a good portion of chapter one this morning and into two. We saw that the aim of Proverbs is to hear the clear call of wisdom and to go after it, to pursue it, right? That we're in a hunger for wisdom and then that we will, the Proverbs are written so that we will mull over it, we will think on it and not just, okay, I heard it, yep, move on, but I'm going to think on this, I'm going to let this ponder, meditate on this, think on it, think have it come over and over again and wash over and think on this thoughtfully, these biblical principles. If we want wisdom, we, we've got to think on it. And what we're going to see this morning out of the text is the, the worth of wisdom. It's the call of wisdom for our lives. And the worth of wisdom is invaluable. The treasures that are come out of this are... Ah, oh, I love it. I've loved this study. Proverbs. Well, I have my Bible open to Proverbs, chapter 1, starting in verse 20. If you're still looking, you're using the Bible on a chair, page 554, page 554. But I want you to turn your Bibles. We're going to be spending our time here in chapter 1 and 2 this morning. Wisdom's worth and how do we get it? Here's where it starts. So follow along with me in just the first two verses of chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. And here is wisdom personified. Here's what it says. Wisdom calls out in the street. She makes her voice heard in the public squares. She cries out above the commotion. She speaks at the entrance of the city gates. So notice wisdom calls out. So there is this personification of wisdom. Lady Wisdom, as we call her. And Lady Wisdom is, is making a call out in the streets. Now, what should make us aware if we have any kind of Jewish background or you understand anything about the Old Testament? And I mean, women didn't have a prominent role in public life. So for a woman to raise her voice in the streets... Something, she must be communicating something of urgent, something of importance that she wants us to know. Wisdom calls out in the street, and, and, and notice too where she's calling from. Notice that she's calling out in the street. I mean, you would think wisdom calls out in the, in the halls of academia. No, Wisdom is calling out in the street. This is the public fair. This is where everybody is passing, where everybody's at. It's not just in the halls of academia. Certainly today, not so much. We find always a lot of wisdom. She's calling here in the place where it's every day. So in the world of the home and the place of work and play and the struggles of life. And notice that Lady Wisdom's call out in the street is also, it's a universal call. Anybody who may hear and anybody may respond. It's open for everybody. You don't have to have a degree. 
You don't have to have a certain social status. This is available for everybody. She makes her voice heard in the public squares. And she's calling. And there's a whole lot of busyness, right? Verse 21, she cries out above the commotion. She speaks at the entrance of the city gates. There's a lot of commotion. There's a lot of busyness going on. And there's all kinds of people passing and moving and all kinds of things happening. She's making a call out to wisdom and saying, hey, will anybody here? Is anybody going to respond? Is anybody going to embrace this? She's calling. It's busy. How many are going to listen? How many that are going to pass by are going to respond to Lady Wisdom? Because they just may be just too busy. Too much commotion happening. Like the violinist who was in a Washington, D.C. subway. The passing. It was 7.51 in the morning on a Friday morning of January 21st of 2007. It was the middle of morning rush hour that in the heart of a D.C. subway interchange was a man who was playing a violin. In 43 minutes of time, this nondescript violinist played six classical pieces. Of that time, 1,097 people passed by the violinist while he played. So the question would be, well, how many stopped and listened? Classical pieces. How many would stop and listen and, or how many would give any money that's laid out in the violin case there? I mean, people are in a hurry and there's a lot of commotion. There's a hustle. There's people that have work that beckons and busyness, right? And what would you do? Would you stop? Would you listen? Maybe throw a buck into the plate, token change. If you're listening, would you, and you heard it, would you stop depending upon how good it is, or would you just pass on by? You see, that was a test that was being done by having this violinist, a rather well-known violinist, <laughs> that uh, was a test to see who would stop. Would anybody stop? It is an experiment that was done on perceptions and priorities. And it was a test that was done to see if beauty would transcend any kind of inconvenient time frames. What the people didn't know, in spite of the music that's going on, is that the, the violinist that was playing, who was standing against the wall in just jeans and a t-shirt and a ball cap, was... Uh, was a classical musician, one of the best in the world. His name was Joshua Bell. He was playing one of the most expensive violins at the time uh, in the world. Get this, $3.5 million violin. A 1713 Stradivarius. Just let that sink in. This world-class violinist playing six classical pieces for 43 minutes as he plays, and there's over a thousand people that pass by in that morning rush hour. How many people do you think, out of a thousand people, are going to stop to listen for one minute or, or more? You think, I mean, maybe at least 10% of those would stop for just a moment to listen to something so exquisite coming through. It's so strange in a place of a Washington, D.C. subway. But there's a lot of commotion, a lot of busyness, a lot of getting from here to there. Out of that time, a total of seven people stopped. Seven 17, seven people stopped to listen for one minute or more. He made a total, a whopping total of $32 and change. 
a guy that typically makes about $1,000 every couple of minutes playing. He made 32 and some change. <laughs> Never a crowd, not even for a second. The people missed it. That's what's going on here. Proverbs chapter 1. Like Joshua Bell in the D.C. subway, Lady Wisdom calls out. And he calls, she calls out to people that are in tune to what they're doing. So busy that they actually miss out. She cries out above the commotion. She speaks at the entrance to city gates. And this is what she calls out to. Here's her questions. How long, how long, inexperienced ones, will you love ignorance? How long will you mockers enjoy mocking and you fools hate knowledge? The writer here brings out three different groups. The inexperienced, ignorant ones. The inexperienced are ones who are naive or simple-minded they, uh, this, the Hebrew in here of inexperienced ignorance has the idea of gullible. They'll fall easily to folly. They chase after what doesn't really matter. They chase after what doesn't really matter. So we have the cry of the inexperienced. Or how long will they hear the inexperienced ones? The second group, how long will you mockers enjoy mocking? The mocker ridicules wisdom. They despise correction. They don't want to be told that they are doing it wrong. Hey, don't correct me. Who do you think you are? They're above correction. And a third group, and you fools, Hate knowledge. The fool. This is thick-headed and stubborn. Interesting with this idea of fools here in Proverbs. This is beyond just a mental issue. This is a spiritual issue. The foolishness isn't that they don't have the capacity. No, in fact, they can hear. They refuse to hear. That's the fool. The fool says, I'm not interested, thank you very much. I don't want to hear. He's placed, he has no place for truth in his life and no time for the fear of the Lord. The fool. They hate this knowledge. They, 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 they love what should repulse us. They hate what should be cherished, the fool. And Lady Wisdom rightly asks, how long? How long? Instead, verse 23, if you respond to my warning, then I will pour out my spirit on you and teach you my words. If you'll respond my spirit will be poured out on you and I'll teach you my words. You, you will learn, you'll grow. There's so much more if you will respond to the calling of Lady Wisdom on the streets. But as we're going to see here, that's not what most do. Not, most won't respond that way, verses 24 and 25. Since I called out and you refused, extended my hand and no one paid attention. Since you neglected all my counsel and did not not accept my correction. They, they refused. They neglected the counsel. They didn't want any correction. The mockers, the, the fools. Verse 26. <laughs> I, in turn, will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when trouble and stress overcome you, then they will call me, but I won't answer. They will search for me, but won't find me. In, in essence, Lady Wisdom calls, and they're 
La, 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 I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want any of it. Refusing to listen. I don't want it. So when calamity comes, now all of a sudden, and we see this in life, right? You make choices that were sinful choices, unwise, foolish choices. We head down a certain way. We're all of a sudden in this big jam. We're in a big pickle. And what do we do? Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, please help me. Oh, please help me, right? The fool will do this over their lifetime, refuse to listen to the fear of the Lord and refuse to listen to what God has to say and fall into calamity and say, oh, please, I'm ready to listen, too late. Verse 29, because they hated knowledge, and didn't choose the fear of the Lord. They were not interested in my counsel and rejected all my correction. And this terrifying verses, they will eat the fruit of their way and be glutted with their own schemes. Again, if you mark your Bibles, their way. They wanted to go their way. Their own schemes. It was my way or the highway. We, we see this lived out and uh, we, we see this come out again in Romans chapter 1. The inexcusable words that the Apostle Paul lays out for us is that those who choose to go their own way ignore God's counsel will get exactly what they desired. It's terrifying. They'll eat their own fruit. Verse 33, but whoever listens to me, what a contrast here. Whoever listens to me will live securely and be undisturbed by the dread of danger, the fear of danger, the dread of it. They'll live securely. There's this huge contrast. They are going to experience those who listen to Lady Wisdom. All right, so all youth who are here. This isn't just for your parents. This isn't just like, oh, to get further down. This is for everybody here. If you have ears to hear, oh, please listen. You want your life. You, you have the ability, the choice, the, the road choice ahead of you. Which way will you choose? And it's laid out for us. And whoever listens to wisdom will live securely and be undisturbed by the dread of danger. You will experience peace in your life. The Apostle Paul again, Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God. Want to experience peace? Listen to wisdom. Get it. Pursue it. Oh, God, help me to hear this. Do, do you read through here and you're like, oh, God, help me. I want this. I don't, I don't want to, to reject what you have to say. Help me to take wisdom by the hand and, and learn. That's my prayer. So I'm reading through, I, I, I want this. I don't want my own way. I want your way, God. So how? What, what does it look like? How, how do I hear and apply it well into my life? Well, chapter two is for you, for me. And so as we, we tackle here chapter two, take note here on just the first four verses, all right? Again, if you write in your Bibles, underline Take note of all of the verbs, verbs, action words, right? Look at all these verbs. So here starts chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, listening closely to wisdom and directing 
your heart to understanding. Furthermore, if you call out to insight and lift your voice to understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it like hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. Did you catch all, all of those verbs? And there's kind of seven verbs in just there. Accept, store up, listening, directing, call, lift, seek, search. And, and the text hinges, all this text hinges on a if then. It's conditional. So maybe you want to circle the if, you'll find the word if three times and it's implied eight times in just these four verses. If, if you accept. Verse three, if you call out. Verse four, if you seek it. Then if like silver, like hidden treasure, you search for it, then understanding of the fear of the Lord and discovering the knowledge of God. Discovering and the knowledge of God. It's a requirement for getting wisdom. It, this, is, this is your directions of where do, I, where do I pour my energies into? Where do I want to go? The pursuit will require understanding the ability to look at two things and distinguish between the, the differences. Which way are you going to go? Which path? The rival at knowing God and acquiring wisdom requires choices, and it will require difficult choices. A lot of, I'm not going to do that, and this is going to be hard to say no. The pursuit of the if and then. If you pursue this, if you go after this, then look what you're going to get. And you're going to see that the wealth of this just unroll, just flow out of this in just a moment. The benefits that come. Verse 6, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. can't help but think the fool has said in his heart there is no God. God is the one who gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. You want to be a good parent. You want to be faithful in your relationships and faithful to your spouse. You want to be wise in the decisions and be a good worker. Then I want to know what wisdom has to say. I want to know what God has to say. And these choices are based upon the revelation of God, not, not just some personal whim within. Well, what's, what's everybody else say? Well, let me just check with Facebook and ask everybody, what do they think? Listen to no man who fails to listen to God. There's a great principle. Listen to no man who fails to listen to God. And the benefits of wisdom come flooding out here. Verses 7 and 8, he stores up success for the upright. He stores up success for the upright. Uh, that success, another way to put that is sound judgment in practical affairs of life. Sound judgment. Here's choices like you, you know where to go. You know what you need to do. Stores of success for the upright. He is a shield for those who live with integrity or live or walk with integrity. There is this, this walk that goes on. It's not just a one-time deal. One choice, awesome. No, it's just ongoing choices of integrity walking with integrity, and he is a shield. Verse 8, so that he may guard the paths of justice. 
and protect the way of his faithful followers. He guards your path. He protects your way. We want that, don't we? That's what we want. Well, what, what defines your life? We're seeing here what's at stake, your life direction. What direction are you going to go at the end of the day? What is your life going to look like when you're on your deathbed? Being a pastor for over 20 years, almost 25 years now, I've done a lot of funerals and I've stood by the bed of a lot of people who are in their final days, taking their final breath. I've never once heard anybody say, you know, I just wish I worked more. If I would have just put more hours in. If I would have just had this, nobody's ever thinking on their deathbed about the more material stuff if they would have had that and pursued that. I've not heard it. What they start thinking about a whole lot is what's after this? How do I live my life? What am I passing on? What's coming after this? What I've seen over and over and over again is have they encountered Christ and what a difference that makes of their attitude and their spirit on their final days. Habits of holiness. The worth of wisdom here in chapter 2 just we're just going to scan what, what happens when you get wisdom. The habits of holiness, verses 9 through 19. There's a list of them I put up on the screen. Then you will understand righteousness, justice, and integrity, every good path. By getting wisdom, pursuing this, going after this, look what you get. You get understanding of righteousness, justice, integrity, every good path. Verse 10, for wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will delight you. You'll, you'll be delighted in, in the knowledge of God. You want that? Here's the the pursuit of this, verse 11, discretion will watch over you and understanding will guard you. Discretion, the, the ability to consider wisely any action before you. Hmm, which way should we go? What should I do? Discretion, understanding. Verse 12, it will rescue you from the evil way. From anyone who says perverse things, from those who abandon the right paths to walk in ways of darkness, from those who enjoy doing evil and celebrate perversion, whose paths are crooked and whose ways are devious. You want to be able to recognize those things? All of a sudden you gain wisdom, you start understanding what God has said to you, and you have this, this radar that's super alert. Whoa, 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 something's off here. You, you'll watch a show and you're like, mm, something's off. Click. Delete. X. I, I don't need to watch this. I don't need, this is not the wisdom of God. I'm, no, turn this off. I, I want protection from the way of evil. I'm not just going to read everything that comes across. Oh, this is a bestseller. It's got to be good. I want wisdom. I want to avoid the paths of darkness. I want habits of holiness. And this wisdom, getting wisdom, says it's going to deliver me from the deception of the evil path. I'll be able to recognize it and, and, and divert and turn away from it. And then verses 16 through 19 is really delivers me from being flattered into unfaithfulness. Verse 16, 
It will rescue you from a forbidden woman, from a wayward woman with her flattering talk, who abandons the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. One of the danger of such a thing, verse 18, for her house sinks down to death and her ways to the land of the departed spirits. None return who go to her. None reach the paths of life. It will guard you from the sexual sin that's so prevalent today. We're going to spend an extended time in a few chapters on this very issue. But for now, oh, get it. Guard your path from the sexual perversion of today. God has laid out what sex should look like. He has set up this is the structure that is healthy and right and how I intended it and it is always right and always good. In this context, we don't have the freedom to restructure it however we want. And the culture around us, the sexual revolution around us has completely rewritten it and so much so that it's not just tolerant. Oh, we just agree to disagree. No, if you don't agree, you are written out. But I want this. Do you? I want protection from pornography and the allurement Let's get satisfied. Now, I want my satisfaction in Christ. I want what's going to satisfy and not destroy relationships, not destroy my heart and mind. I want the cross burned into my image. Oh. Just this capture the risk and now the final plea verses 20 through 22 so follow the way of the good and keep to the paths of the righteous for the upright will inhabit the land and those of integrity will remain in it do we not see so many who are falling today who have ignored the way of wisdom and have have such damage in their lives not just sexual sin right i mean it goes far beyond just sexual sin who have made such financial choices or health choices Choices that have been just loaded with, I can do whatever I want, how I want to do it. I don't care what anybody has to say. I'm going to do it myself. And where does it lead? Verse 22, but the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous ripped out of it. We have two paths before us. So which will you take? This is a call to, to wisdom. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your social status. It doesn't matter your income. The pain that comes from ignoring and refusing to listen. Calamity will come. The worth of wisdom is what is going to satisfy. And so the, the call of Lady Wisdom is, oh, would you listen? Would you get it? Pursue it. Seek it, right? Verse 4, if you seek it like silver, search for it like hidden treasure. I'm going to go after it. I'm going to pursue it. I'm going to study it like it's a hidden treasure. And God has made it crystal clear that it's found in him. Seek him. Call out for wisdom. Go after it. 
there is a better way, a far better way than going our own way. Which path are you on? That's really the, the call here. Which, what, are, what are you going to pursue? Which way are you going to go? Two paths, which route? Choose wisely. This morning, maybe you find yourself on a path that you know is, is dangerous, the pain that's coming. You've been on your own way, your own schemes. It is not too late. Change course. Change course. Seek, search, go after, call out, lift up your voice, listen closely, direct your heart. Store up the commands, accept God's word. He will not disappoint you. You will not be sorry that you sought him. Let's pray. God, the call here is clear. What path will we go after? God, I want to go after your way. There is no other way but yours. And God, in a church this size, there are a number of folks who are going their own way that have been making choices that are destructive, painful. There is sexual sin. There is a wealth of sin that is being pursued after and is going to lead to calamity. And God, I pray that they would turn to an infinite God who knows everything and cares and will forgive and will restore and heal. The God who beckons to come home. The Father who runs who runs to the prodigal. Oh God, we pray that you would turn hearts to you. That God, those on the path will, will, will mull over and think on your word. That will make it a life pursuit not of the world's wisdom, but God of yours, and be satisfied. We bring this before you. We're grateful that you are at work, and I thank you, God, that you will not remain silent. And it is in Jesus' powerful, almighty name, because of Christ that I call upon you in Jesus' name, amen.